Okay. Good evening. Welcome to the Sovereign Grace Assembly Wednesday night Bible study. Glad you could make it. Hope you brought your Bibles. If you didn't, go get it real quick. I'll wait. Tonight we are going to still be in Luke 22. And probably not going to finish it tonight. we got a lot of ground to cover and it's too important to rush through. So, let's have a word of prayer and we will get started. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you for allowing us to do this Bible study. And I thank you for each and everyone who's watching it live. And I thank you for everyone who... God, I pray that what I speak will be the words you want me to speak. That those who are watching, those who are listening, will understand that you'll open their ears. And that you will use this to give them more knowledge of you. And God, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, last week, we were in the upper room. The Last Supper, the final Passover. And if you recall, back in verse 24, Luke 22, it says, Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercised lordship over them, and those who exercised lordship over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is the greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. So, Jesus is getting ready to be crucified. And the apostles are arguing about who's going to be the better one. And we jump forward, Jesus goes on and says a few other things. We jump forward to verse 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you've returned to me, strengthen your brethren. But he said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you, both to prison and to death. And then he said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster shall not crow this day before you will deny me three times, deny three times that you know me. Now, Simon, Simon. Obviously, when Jesus repeats the name, we know that it's implied that he's about to give him a warning. It's kind of like when you're were young and your mother or father called you. You know, it's like if they went, John Calvin, you better not do that. You know, it's you know when you hear both names, you're in trouble. Christ gave Simon the name Peter, but here <laughs> he reverts back to calling him Simon probably to emphasize the rebuke he's going to give him over his overconfidence and desire to be the greatest. Tends to make me believe that Peter was one of the most vocal of the arguers about who was going to be greatest. But Jesus says that he prayed for him that Satan would not sift him and that ultimately Peter would win out and he encourages Peter that when he does win out that he would encourage the brethren and he says I have prayed for you not fail we know the rest of the story. P 
Peter failed miserably. Terribly. He denied Christ three times, as we're going to cover in just a minute. Yet, his faith never failed. Peter the man failed, but Peter's faith stayed strong. Verse 35. And he said, he, Jesus, and he said to them, when I sent you out, when I sent you without money bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? So they said, nothing. Then he said to them, but now, he who has a money bag, let him take it, and likewise a knapsack. And he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. For I say to you that that, I say to you that this which is written must still be accomplished in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for the things concerning me have an end. So they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it's enough. Jesus is saying the future is not going to be as easy as things were in the past. But now, in verse 36, when Christ sent them out before, he provided for their needs. In his sovereignty, he arranged everything. From now on, they would have to use normal means to provide for their own support and provisions. Money bag, knapsack, sword were figurative expressions that they were going to have to take care of themselves. And that he was numbered with the transgressors. That's from Isaiah 53, 12. So Jesus is still quoting scripture. He's still quoting the Old Testament. Verse 39. Coming out, he went to the Mount of Olives as he was accustomed, and his disciples also followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel appeared to him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Then he said to them, Why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. <clears throat> he left the upper room, went to the Mount of Olives, and he left most of them at the gate of Gethsemane took Peter, James, and John inside with him to pray. Now, Luke doesn't tell us that, but the other gospel writers did, that Peter, James, and John went with him. And I, and I love the way Luke says, when he came to the place, Luke doesn't even tell us what the place is. Fortunately, Mark tells us it was Gethsemane. And John tells us it was in an olive grove. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, Luke doesn't tell us about Peter, James, and John, who slept while Jesus prayed, even though he told them to stay here and pray. And Jesus went about a stone's throw away, which is within earshot. They could hear him. And his prayer was partly for their benefit. And what did he pray? 
if it's your will, take this cup away from me. But, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So what's the cup? The cup represents God's divine wrath. God is one day going to pour out his wrath on this world. On all those people who are not saved, who are not Christians, who are not followers of Jesus Christ are going to suffer the wrath of God. Jesus knows that he's about to suffer the wrath of God for those whom God chose before the foundation of the world. In the future, God will pour out his wrath on individuals. Jesus knows he's about to take the wrath of every individual whom God has given him. Not just for one person, but for every one of them. And he says, take this cup away from me. He doesn't want to suffer the wrath of God because he knows how bad it's going to be. A perfectly normal expression of his humanity. If you remember, Jesus was God in the flesh. So he did not want to suffer the divine wrath. But he willingly took that wrath because it was the will of his Father. In this prayer, he is consciously, deliberately, and voluntarily subjugating all of his human desires to the Father's perfect will. There's no conflict between Father and Son, nor between the deity of Christ and his human desires. So what happens? God the Father sends an angel to strengthen him. Luke's the only person that mentions this angel. And he continues to pray. Luke says he prayed more earnestly. And then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. Now let me get technical here for a minute. And you may have heard this before. You, in fact, if you've been a Christian in a Bible teaching church, then I know you've heard this before. There's a condition. It's known as, and I will try and pronounce this correctly, hematidrosis. It's caused by extreme anguish or physical strain. Now, we know Jesus was under extreme anguish. And what happens is the capillaries dilate and burst, mingling blood with your sweat. Thus, he sweat dropped of blood. In fact, Christ himself says his distress had brought him to the threshold of death. Just the distress. So in verse 45, he's done praying. And when he rose up, he had from his prayer and had come to his disciples, he found them sleeping from sorrow. Now, just as this emotional strain was wearing on Jesus, it was wearing on his disciples. But their response, rather than praying, was to submit to their fleshly desires and go to sleep. They gratified their 
desire for sleep rather than staying awake to pray. Now, if you have ever been in an extremely stressful situation that went on for a period of time, you know that the body's reaction is oftentimes just a desire for sleep. You can sleep for hours and hours if you can shut your mind off because your body doesn't want to deal with that. So you just sleep. And Jesus said to them, why do you sleep? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Thing to remember, one thing to remember anyhow, is that in those days, when you prayed, for the most part you stood. You know, whether you stood and bowed your head, whether you stood, looked to heaven, Praying was not standing. So he tells them, rise up and pray so that you won't enter into temptation. Now, he may have been telling them to stand up because they, they were sleeping, they were drowsy, you know, and it's generally harder to fall asleep if you're standing up. Matthew and Mark tell us that he caught them sleeping another time. At least, so they, they went to sleep twice. But then, we go to verse 47. And while he was still speaking, behold, a multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Remember, they said, we got two swords. <laughs> and one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus answered and said, Permit even this, and he touched his ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you didn't try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Now, if you remember, a kiss was a very common greeting in those days. And in the Middle East, it still is, you know. But to use it in this way, for Judas to betray Jesus by kissing him was a horrible form of betrayal. I mean, just unbelievable. But it's kind of comical, not the kiss part. But in verse 50, one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Now, I got to believe that when they whipped out the sword and tried to get the high priest's servant, they just missed. I'm sure they weren't aiming for his ear. And the thing is, all four of the Gospels record this. So it was obviously something that really stood out. But John, John who gives us information that a lot of the other Gospel writers doesn't give us, he reveals that the swordsman was Peter. 
So, once again, Peter messes up. And he, John also tells us that the servant's name was Maccus, servant of the high priest. But Luke, the physician, he's the only one that tells us about the healing. He says in verse 51, <coughs> Jesus answered and said, Permit even this. And he touched his ear and healed him. So, they're standing there. Peter lops the guy's ear off. You know, I'm assuming going for the head. Misses, of course. Jesus reaches up, touches the guy, and heals his wound. Now, the interesting part of this is, this is the only instance in all of Scripture where Christ healed a flesh wound. We have him raising people from the dead. We have him healing leprosy, healing blindness, casting demons out, healing the mute, healing the woman with a discharge just by her touching his robe. Only flesh wound in the entire Bible is right here. And the other interesting thing is, it's the only time that Jesus healed an enemy. He wasn't asked to heal him. He did it unasked. And there was absolutely no evidence of faith in the recipient of the healing. Jesus just reached out and healed the guy. And one other thing about it is, it seems that this dramatic miracle, because you can't call it anything other than dramatic, had absolutely no effect whatsoever on the hearts of those men who were there to arrest Jesus. If you remember back in John, when they came up to arrest him, he asked who they were looking for, and they said, Jesus of Nazareth? And he said, I am he. I am being the name of God. And they all fell back to the, on the ground. Well, obviously that didn't affect him either because they still arrested him. So, they were bound and determined. <coughs> And the reason they were bound and determined because it was part of God's sovereign plan. Nothing was going to change that. Fifty-two. And Jesus said to the chief priests, captains of the temple, and the elders who had come out to him, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? When I was with you daily in the temple, you didn't try to seize me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. It's nighttime, the hours of darkness. They didn't have the courage to confront Jesus in the temple, in the presence of the crowds, in the middle of the day. And he had been there all week, every day, teaching in the temple. Mm -mm, not going to go arrest him then. They're going to go out in the middle of the night, when nobody's around, And grab him. It's fitting that under cover of darkness they did the work of the prince of darkness, Satan. So they took him off. Verse 54. Having arrested him, they led him and brought him into the high priest's house. But Peter followed at a distance. Now when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the courtyard and sat down together, <coughs> Peter sat among them. And a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by the fire, looked intently at him and said, 
This man was also with them. But he denied him, saying, Woman, I don't know him. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And then after about an hour had passed, another confidently affirmed, saying, Surely this fellow is also with him, for he is also a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are saying. Immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Then Peter remembered the words of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So Peter went out and wept bitterly. <coughs> the high priest's house. Jesus was taken first to the high priest who had ordered his arrest. Now, all four Gospels give more space to the trial of Jesus than they do to the crucifixion. And the reason for that is that they're answering questions about why the Jews condemned Jesus and why the Romans executed him and bringing out his identity as the Son of God and the King of the Jews. Now, this is Caiaphas' house where they took him. And all four of the Gospels record that Peter followed. John indicates that another disciple, presumably himself, also followed. And in verse 56, <clears throat> a certain servant girl, seeing him as he sat by her fire, looked intently at him and said, This man was also with him. Now, all four Gospels mentioned this servant girl. She appears to have been the doorkeeper of Annas' house. She says, this man was with him. He says, <coughs> he denies it. Now John tells us that that first denial took place while Jesus was being examined by Annas, by Annas' father-in-law, Caiaphas. Both accounts, Luke and John, Mention a fire in the court courtyard. I almost said fire in the courthouse. <laughs> in the courtyard. So it could be that Annas' and Caiaphas' house shared a courthouse. They lived right next to each other. They were probably within the same um, compound. A lot of times in those days, you know, a house was within a walled compound. And especially for somebody who was the high priest. I mean, that's a pretty important position. You know, they would have a much larger area. So if they shared, <coughs> they may have shared a courtyard. Now, only John mentions the examination by Annas. So the other Gospels describe Peter's three denials as an incident that took place on the porch and the courtyard of Caiaphas's house. Now, verse 58. And after a little while, another saw him and said, You also are of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. Someone else saw him. <laughs> We're going to get technical here. Someone else is a masculine pronoun in Greek indicating that it was a man that said, said that. And Peter responded with another denial. And in an hour passes, Jesus is still, you know, being interviewed. And somebody else says, this guy was with him. For he is a Galilean. 
How did they know he was a Galilean? I'm sure Galileans look the same as Judeans, but they talk different. His accent would have given him away. And then the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Luke's the only one that records that Jesus made eye contact with Peter. And the verb that's used suggests <coughs> excuse me, an intent fixed look. Kind of like Peter said it, Jesus just looked at him and stared at him. And I got to believe that Peter saw Jesus looking at him. And in Peter's eyes, it was probably a accusing you did exactly what I said you were going to do even though you said you weren't going to do it. But I also have to believe that it, rather than that, Jesus looked at Peter with sympathy because Jesus knew he was going to do it and he knew how it was going to affect Peter, what Peter's reaction to his actions were. But the question is, if Jesus was being interviewed by the high priest, how did he see Peter? The fact that he could see Peter suggests to us, we don't know because none of the Gospels actually tell us, that the men holding Jesus had already brought him out to the courtyard to meet him. Verse 63. Now the men who held Jesus mocked him and beat him. And having blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is the one who struck you? And many other things they blasphemously spoke against him. <coughs> now, Luke hasn't included any details about Caiaphas' interrogation of Jesus, which Matthew and Mark do. But this beating and mockery evidently took place after the first examination, before the Sanhedrin could hold their first hearing, or their official hearing, not their first one, because it was their only one. So Jesus is beaten and mocked. And then, verse 66, As soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and led him into their council, saying, If you are the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, If I tell you, you by no means believe. And if I also ask you, you will by no means answer. You will know my by no means answer me or let me go. Hereafter, the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then they all said, Are you then the Son of God? So he said to them, You rightly say that I am. And they said, What further testimony do we need? For we have heard it ourselves from his own mouth. So, there's a lot to cover in those few verses. First off, no single gospel gives a complete account of Jesus' trial. It's clear there were two main stages. The Jews tried him before the Sanhedrin and obtained a verdict that he was a blasphemer and deserved to die. But, only the Romans had the right to ex execute him. 
And they wouldn't execute a man for blasphemy. They could care less. So there had to be a further trial before the Romans for a violation of their law. Now, and if you notice, Luke didn't speak of any formal accusation or a trial according to proper procedure. Sanhedrin simply required that Jesus incriminate himself according to their understanding of the Messiah. And he wouldn't do that. Because they wouldn't believe him. But he did say that a change was coming. When he said in verse 69, Hereafter the Son of Man will sit on the right hand of the power of God. He'll be in the place of the highest honor in heaven. So that's what's happening in this next five verses. But, let's go back to verse 66. As soon as it was day, because you have to understand, criminal trials were not legal if they were held at night. So even though Jesus has been interviewed by Caiaphas and Annas and Caiaphas, that wasn't a trial. The Sanhedrin waited until daybreak when they could legally convict him. They could legally hold the trial and convict him of what they had already decided. <coughs> so what did they do? They subjected him to the same sort of questions that he'd been asking in his nighttime trial. And the answers he gave were substantially the same. Jesus conceded to the Sanhedrin's charge that he claimed to be the Son of God. So as far as they were concerned, he was guilty of blasphemy. But, persuading the Romans would require a totally different charge. But for the Sanhedrin, it was over. They had convicted him. Jesus was guilty in their eyes and remained just to come up with a charge to secure his execution. They had accomplished their purpose. What they didn't realize was that they had accomplished God's purpose. This was all part of God's plan. This was all part of the plan from the beginning. Before the angel met Zacchaeus in the temple, to tell him about John the Baptist that he was going to have a son who would be the predecessor the person who would go before the Messiah the death of Christ was written in stone it was all part of the plan It was a plan that was God created before the foundation of the world. It was a plan that God created for his elect. Those who were to be saved thousands of years later. It was a plan that no matter what man did, God was going to fulfill. And frankly, I love it when a plan comes together. Because this is a great plan. This is a plan that we know was fulfilled and is still being fulfilled. The death, burial, and resurrection 
of Jesus Christ is the greatest thing that ever happened on this planet, in this universe. Because through it, wretched sinners can have their sins forgiven. They can be made right with God. And this is the only way that could have happened. So if you are one of those wretched sinners who has not yet been made right with God, maybe it's time you started thinking about it. Maybe it's time you recognized that this is deadly serious stuff. Maybe it's time you think about where you're going to spend eternity. You need to go to God and say, God, I'm a wretched sinner. I need your son's blood to cover me. We're done. Shockingly, we made it to the end of chapter 22. I really didn't think we'd make it. So, what's next? Next week, chapter 23. Jesus has been convicted by the Jews. The Sanhedrin has pronounced the death penalty. Now, it's up to the Romans. So next week, we're going to look at Jesus before Pilate, before Herod, before Pilate again, And we're probably not going to get to the crucifixion. But we might. It all depends on what God's got in mind. What his plan is. So, we're done. But, let me tell you the really good news. The other good news. I just told you the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins so we could spend eternity with him. But we have some vocal good news. And I mentioned last week that we were going to be making a big announcement Sunday morning. Well, if you haven't watched our Sunday morning service, how come you haven't watched our Sunday morning service? You should have watched that. It was really good. Elder Stephen did a great job. But if you didn't watch it, and you haven't been to our website, we will now be meeting on Sunday mornings in Versailles. We are meeting at the Tyson Activity Center, known to many as Tyson Auditorium, which it was since 1950. We meet at 9.30 for Sunday school, except for this week. This week we will not be having Sunday school um, starting next week, Sunday the 21st, Sunday school at 9.30. 10.30 starting this week is our worship service. We would love to have you join us. A couple things to know. Um, come in through entrance number three. That's the door on the northwest corner of the building. Um, lots of parking. There's nothing going on at Tyson on Sunday mornings. So we're not going to have to worry about kids playing basketball and guys in the weight room and all that kind of stuff. Everything is shut down. We, we have the building. Um, so join us at 1030. The other thing you need to be aware of is, as I said, Tyson Auditorium was built in 1950. It is on the historical register, which means it's, for the most part, 
original. I mean, there's been repairs made to it and some updates. But the area where we meet is not handicap accessible. If you come to join us, you will have to walk up some steps. And when you leave, you'll have to walk down some steps. Now, they're not too bad, but there isn't, there's like no wheelchair ramp or, you know, so you have to be able to go up and down steps. But we would love to have you join us for that. 10.30 this Sunday morning. And then after that, 9.30 for Sunday school, 10.30 for worship service. And we would love to have you come out. It's been great meeting at one of the elders' homes. Uh, have been for five months, almost six months. Um, but God has provided a spot for us, and we hope that it'll be much better for reaching out to the community. So with that, have a wonderful week. Read your Bible every day. Study what it tells you. I am amazed at the number of people who call themselves Christians who the only time they ever pick up the Bible might be when they're on their way to church Sunday morning. God gave us the Bible for a reason. Because it's how we come to know Him. So, give up your favorite TV show. Give up that TV show you don't really care for, but you watch because it's on. And read your Bible. You'd be amazed at what God would teach you. So for now, <coughs> have a wonderful week. I will see you Sunday morning. We will still be doing Facebook Live, but in person is always better. You know, We'd love to get to know you. So hopefully I will see you Sunday morning. I'll be here next Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, Facebook Live. the Roman trials of Jesus. So for now, good week. Go serve your king. Let me pop this off. <laughs>